very good afternoon all of you uh, i am dr shushruta shen president of association of clinical chemistry and lab medicine practitioners <clears throat> national head and uh, we are very proud to announce that for the first time with our own platform we are organizing one webinar and which comprises pan india most of the participants and panelists are coming from all over our state chapters so it is our first venture and we wish uh, it to be very successful so before we start the webinar so we'll uh, ask all the audience that whenever you have any questions about any after any speaker's uh, speech please uh, keep it as a chat and text us i will uh, select all the best of the fives because of our time shortage and uh, we'll actually discuss it at the end of the panel and now i'd uh, better introduce all our uh, panelists as well as moderators uh, their esteemed speakers they are very well known persons but better who you would introduce one by one and then i would hand over the panel discussion to the moderator so the in, we are inviting on the panel discussion on dry chemistry platform a promising window in the world of analytical chemistry as seen through the eyes of both the savvy and the naive so the panelists have actually been chosen in such a way that some of them are very much acquainted with this dry chemistry technology they are regular users some of them are not so we have taken a mixed population so that the entire panel discussion becomes very unbiased and very eye opener for everybody so to start with that we will be starting with the first speaker uh, as one of the panelists dr rajarshi sharkar who has done his md and dnb in biochemistry and he is director of laboratory services of gd hospital and diabetes institute kolkata as well as is a consultant biochemist of dr roy and tribedi diagnostic laboratory kolkata visiting consultant of dr bisira institute of medical science and research of iit kharagpur and the area of interest is clinical chemistry immunoassay and quality control algorithms and the he is presently a president of acc lmp west bengal chapter next i talk about dr kinjal ka ghosh a very well known and learned speaker that he has done his md and dnb in biochemistry then mnams and mrays from by of translational cancer medicine from kings college london he is presently acting as an associate professor and consultant biochemist of tata memorial hospital of taral mumbai area of interest is clinical biochemistry immunology and cancer biochemistry he has more than 20 publications in various national and international journals and presently he is holding the post of general secretary of sclnp maharashtra chapter next we talk about another very learned person dr rajkumari vidyavati devi she is associate professor of department of biochemistry of jawaharlal institute nehru institute of medical science and she has done md biochemistry from acme she is presently holding so many important posts like nodal officer of biochemistry clinical laboratory pre clinical curriculum committee member member of medical education unit and as well as joint secretary of academic society of the same institute and she is a resource person in various cme workshops and both national and international conferences more than 20 publications in international and national journals and area of interest is clinical biochemistry and hormone assays and presently she is holding the post of president sclnp manipur state chapter next dr ruplekha chakraborty she is also a very busy practitioner she has done md biochemistry from guwahati medical college guwahati working in eastern nursing home and research institute since 2002 as consultant biochemist and lab in charge and also promoter of purbojati healthcare private limited and head of quality control of gloria diagnostic center she is presently holding the post as a joint secretary sclmp assam chapter next dr lieutenant colonel dipika gulati she is uh, md she has done md biochemistry from afmc pune 
trained also trained in pathology and microbiology apart from biochemistry worked in various military hospitals of armed forces and presently consultant biochemist at base hospital delhi cantonment affiliated with acms special interest lipids in clinical biochemistry and she is a member of ssel and p delhi <clears throat> next up dr rekha kumari she has done by md in biochemistry now presently she is head of the department of department of biochemistry indira gandhi institute of medical sciences patna resource faculty of meu igims patna and also she is the executive committee member of ssel mp bihar chapter last we are talking about introducing the moderator so dr sharmisha choudhury she is currently working as assistant professor in department of biochemistry ardikar medical college and hospital she has done mbbs from anaras medical college and md as well as senior residency from aims new delhi she has done pg diploma in hospital uh, management from national institute of health and family welfare new delhi working as faculty under west bengal medical education service member of editorial board of journal of applied biochemistry and laboratory medicine this particular uh, uh, <coughs> journal is the journal of ssel mp and she is uh, holding the post of the uh, in the editorial board which we are going to be uh, releasing this journal this month end only so she has worked very hard on that and also published various research articles and actively participating as guest speaker in many cme and conferences and as a, a portfolio holder she is assistant general secretary of sclmp west bengal chapter now i'll hand over the entire uh, webinar platform to dr sharmista choudhury to moderate the entire platform and we'll uh, start the webinar now thank you So it is indeed a great to host this event. Thank you, SSLMP. Thank you, SSLMP, for giving me this opportunity. So, without further ado, we'll we'll start our uh, webinar. So, can I have the first question, please? So my first question will be directed to Dr. Kinjal Kaghosh, sir. Uh, before we begin this topic per se, I would just like to brief our audience on the very basic on the role multi-sites which are used in dry chemistry platforms, because uh, as we know that. So, sir, if you can. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank ACCLMP for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this wonderful discussion. And uh, secondly, uh, the question is a very interesting question. Uh, as you know, the dry chemistry platforms are very much different from the wet chemistry ones. And one of the key differences in this technology is the multi-layer slide. So uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so as you can see, the dry slide technology that is used in the dry chemistry is based on a principle of reflectance spectrophotometry. And although it seems uh, to be just a single slide that gives to it, uh, the important layers are the spreading layer, the scavenger layer, a reagent layer, indicator layer, and support layer. All these layers play a very unique and important role in the assay system that is made. It can be made for both uh, normal or uh, routine biochemistry assays, as well as the potentiometric analysis of the electrolytes. So you get majorly two, two three different types of slides that are there. The first layer is the spreading layer, which is basically a porous capillary network. It is very important and its main role is to spread the blood sample to the underlying layers. The next layer 
is the scavenger layer where it uh, filters out most of the abnormal proteins and it reduces interferences. And finally, you have a reagent layer where the main chemical reaction takes place. And depending on the kind of assay that you're performing, it may be a single step reaction or a multiple step reaction. Finally, whatever the pr products are generated from that reaction are combined with a coloring chromogen that is present in the indicator layer. And the light is reflected from there as against the wet chemistry where you have It, the concentration of the analyte can be calculated very nicely. So these different layers play a very unique role in the dry slide technology and add to its improved accuracy and precision. Next. Yeah, this is what it looks like when uh, on one side, yeah, and this is the potentiometric slide here. You can do uh, an, uh, electrolyte analysis. It involves a direct IC technology over here. And as you can see, both wet chemistry and uh, like routine analysis, routine analytes of wet chemistry and electrolytes can be done on a single platform. So these are the different types of uh, slides that are available. So these slides can be manufactured depending on the kind of analysis that is required. And all the things that are present in the wet chemistry, like endpoint, multipoint, those things are incorporated in the reaction slides that are there. And that is why it is very much similar to the wet chemistry platforms. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh, for the best introduction you've given us. So what looks very simple is actually quite complicated. Now, my next question will be directed to Dr. Deepika Gulati. So Dr. Ghosh was just saying that there are multiple layers. They have different names. They serve different purposes. But which, according to you, which layer do you think, out of all these, is the most vital, multifunctional, as well as the most instrumental in reducing interferences. Ma'am, if you can enlighten us a bit. Yeah, uh, good evening. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank the organizers, ACCLMP and Dr. Sain for giving me this opportunity. Now, uh, Dr. Kinjalka has already explained about the various layers in a slide utilized by the dry chemistry analyzer. Uh, can I have the next slide? Spreading layer and scavenger layer, which is also known as the masking layer, are the most vital and multifunctional layers. They are the topmost layers, and in the sample encounters these layers first. Now, these layers also help in reducing interferences. They form a porous capillary network and trap large molecules like lipids, proteins, and hemoglobin. These layers, apart from forming a physical barrier, they also optically block potentially interfering compounds. As a result, the sample obtained after crossing these layers is a type of protein-free filtrate, and the value obtained is free from interference. Can I have the next slide, please? Can I have the next slide? Yeah. This layer also helps in spreading the sample throughout the surface uniformly and percolate to the reaction layer in a uniform manner. Last but not the least, its undersurface acts as a reflecting surface for reflectance spectrophotometry on which the entire measurement of dry chemistry is based. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gulati. So the thing is that with uh, dry chemistry, the USP lies mostly in reducing interferences. So there must be something in dry chemistry which is different from conventional wet chemistry platforms. That is what one is led to believe. So we've been talking with our past two speakers and they have constantly used this term reflectance spectrophotometry. So my next question, which is directed at Dr. Ruplekha Chakravarti, ma'am, if you can please elaborate the principle of this reflectance spectrophotometry 
and what advantage how is it different from conventional spectrophotometry if you can please tell our audience and us yes uh, good evening everyone uh, initially i want to thank ssc lmp for giving me this prestigious platform for being a panelist very sim simple please uh, next slide please next slide please in a very simple lenses technique surface reflectance is measured either at a given wavelength or by performing a performing a scan over a range of wavelengths Reflectance measurement is made using both the diffuse and the specularly reflected light. Then this reflectance is measured by using the equation R is equal to I R by I naught, where R is the reflecting power, I naught is the incident of the incident light intensity, and I R is the intensity of the reflected light. This technique can be mostly used in a dry surface or solid surface. so it is mainly used in clinical clinical chemistry is mainly used in the dry chemistry platform here in the dry chemistry multiple layer technique film technique is used where there is a, principally there is three layers uh, first is the spreading layer which also act as a reflecting background then the second layer which is the reagent layer where the desired chromogens are formed and third is the transparent support medium which allows light to flow through it when sample is applied on the spreading layer it diffuses into the reagent layer and where the chromogens are formed then light coming from the source is reflected from the reagent layer and to the spectrophotometer and these are then calculated this reflectance values are then calculated to find the uh, concentration of the substance <clears throat> coming to the second part of the question in this uh, dry chemistry regarding the second part of the question in this uh, spectrophotometry it is uh, unlike the conventional spectrophotometric technique this dry chemistry or this uh, reflectance spectrophotometry is independent of the sample thickness so it allows to use undiluted sample and also there is very stringent stringent requirement of sample volume as this principle is mainly used in dry chemistry so next slide please next slide please so other advantages are there is less repeating step next slide please there is less repeating step one only one step for the sample where is in the wet chemistry there are two pipetting step one for the sample and other for the reagents it decreases some amount of error and uh, being a dry system there is no need of water so no need of drain no need of drain and uh, plumbing here no maintenance cost for water treatment plant and this it and it eliminates the risk of error associated with water quality here disposable single use tips are used which eliminates the risk of carry over then we get extended calibration time here low throughput and high s and it there is starting and uh, starting time and the closing time for this machine is less than the other conventional method all these things make it a very very easy to use uh, sorry all this make this system a very easy to use system or technique thank you thank you ma'am that was very nicely explained and especially the differences as well as the advantages of uh, the reflectance spectrophotometry over the conventional spectrophotometry was very nice so taking this from here onwards can i have the question please 
So, uh, as far as uh, Dr. Chakravarti said, the reflective spectrophotometry definitely makes life easier. It is a much more uh, pinpointed technique, and may, and definitely the work that goes with real day-to-day -day measurements is much reduced with reflectance spectrophotometry and dry chemistry. So, my next question is directed at Dr. Rajkumari Vidyabati Devi, ma'am. Does the dry chemistry actually supersede the wet chemistry platforms, particularly with respect to accuracy and precision, because these are two very important aspects in any clinical laboratory functioning. So if you can just tell us about this. Thank you. Uh, uh, to be involved in this very interesting uh, dry chemistry platform. And thank you so much to uh, all this uh, AC, AC, uh, ACLMP uh, for bringing me to this uh, platform. Yes, uh, this, uh, please uh, show me the slide. Please show me the slide. Please show me the slide. Oh, yes. So uh, dry chemistry, most advanced technology on fully automated biochemistry platform, giving quick, reliable, accurate, and consistent patient result. So th there is single disposable slide for every test with unique and multi-layer dry slide technology, which already uh, previous panelists has described. And this technology produces better precision and accuracy. So calibration stability for dry um, chemistry is uh, IAC is four to five months. So here calibration is very uh, important. And also this uh, layered dry slide technology enables separate reaction domains, such as that each step can be optimized to provide excellent assay performance, excellent precision and accuracy are achieved through design that combine multiple discrete layer of spreading, masking, scavenger, and other reagent layer that together improve the quality of the results. So these dry slide methods are used traditional, well accepted analytical principle and are traceable uh, to accepted reference methods also. So the, as uh, earlier uh, this uh, speakers, uh, panelists has also described the spreading layer, grid uh, protein free filtrate, Binding layers and shelters remove the interferences. And uh, this, uh, whereas in wet chemistry, calibration frequency ranges from once daily, once every three days, one weekly, depending on the analyte. And the calibration is a major concern. So in dry chemistry, uh, it is interested operator and uh, supervisor efficiency less downline, less paperwork, less calibrator and reagent material. So no reagent is uh, wasted. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So here also this dry chemistry, it minimizes the effect of the interferences like hemolysis, then lipemia and ictrus. So uh, some example of some uh, this uh, slide which eliminate are magnesium slide, burn slide, and bilirubin slide. So uh, this uh, dry chemistry, uh, it is uh, it, it's coming up and everyone likes the result all over the world. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So what we have good points in favor of dry chemistry. It reduces interferences. It has multifunctional slides. The principle is very robust. There is very little need for calibration. It's very easy to use. It's absolutely very funky and great. So this is that in the domain. So my next question is directed at Dr. Rekha Kumari. Do you think that this dry chemistry technology is much under taught in our PG curriculum? I mean, our MG, MG students are not getting enough exposure on such beautiful and robust techniques. 
compared to the other technologies which they are getting exposure to or which they are being taught more like hplc or chemiluminescence or mass spectrophotometry so ma'am can you just uh, share your views on this uh, good evening all the panelists uh, moderator dr sarmista choudhury and uh, all of our audience and thank you to this organization which gave me the platform to present myself here uh dr sarmista you have already uh, put the question about the less part given to dry chemistry in the pg curriculum yes you are right the pg curriculum has also been changed about and it is based now on the competency based medical education like the mbbs curriculum and uh, in that curricula if you see the new curricula uh there are syllabus defined for the theory part for the practical part and in practical part they have written the student who are giving uh, taking the degree of uh, masters from biochemistry they should be exposed to different type of practical experiences that is in uh, immuno assay uh, general chemistry routine chemistry electrophoresis chromatography and all here the technologies which are mentioned that is hplc high pressure uh, high performance liquid chromatography clia chemiluminescent immuno assay and mass spectrophotometry these are actually advanced technologies and it is not possible that every lab or every medical college where the pg degree is contains all this uh, advanced technologies like uh, hplc and clia you can get but mass spectrometry very less uh, laboratories are having it and uh, in the practical part they have mentioned that uh, both uh, manual method and the automated method of chemistry or uh, immuno assay the medical students that pg students have to be exposed but they have not demarcated or emphasized particularly on the wet chemistry or dry chemistry so dry chemistry used in uh, if you are not using the auto analyzer or maximum burden you are not doing on that then also little instrument of dry chemistry we are using in our uh, hospitals or lab so our students are get exposed but to know every detail of dry chemistry i think they should be exposed to dry chemistry analyzer also and uh, if there is not the provision of any hospital they can tie up with the hospital which has dry chemistry uh, uh, facilities and they can depute their students for one or uh, two months for a exposure so that after completing their master degree when they are exposed to the real scenario of uh, investigations on their own head they can determine they can decide how to go what to choose and what are the advantages of dry chemistry and wet chemistry so it is essential that they should be exposed to this type of chemistry also thank you thank you ma'am so much that was very nicely said and uh, ma'am has actually brought out a wonder, uh, very good way out of a seemingly difficult situation it is understandable that most of the setups which have pg curriculum may not or actually do not have the setup for dry chemistry start my is a particular area but uh, which we call the in interferences or the hil the hemolysis the icterus and the lipemia which students uh, faculty members technologists alike we constantly encounter in our setups both government as well as private and these need to be tackled so my next question which is directed at dr rajeshi sarkar is having worked with two distinct dry chemistry systems not one but two as well as wet chemistry ones which do you feel are better equipped to deal with these hil interferences and how dr sarkar if you can please tell us uh, thank you dr sharmista i believe uh, this is quite a hot button topic with a lot of chatter going on uh, amongst us biochemists regarding the perceived am i audible 
Hello. Hello. Yes, you yes, are audible. audible. Please continue. Okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, there is a lot of chatter amongst us by chemists regarding the perceived, uh, you know, the, the advantages of dry chemistry systems when it comes to dealing with interferences. But before we delve into into this topic proper, uh, it would be uh, important for us to ascertain why we think so, why we think that the uh, dry chemistry platforms should have bit, should have a better uh, repertoire when it comes to dealing with interferences. So uh, part of part of the explanation uh, would be the. Uh, the filtration procedure which takes place in the micro slide, micro slides of dry, dry chemistry, which has been explained very succinctly by Dr. Ghosh and Dr. Gulati. I wouldn't uh, dwell on that subject, but the other part of the <clears throat> explanation uh, would uh, take us on a detour to, uh, to a certain theoretical, uh, to certain uh, theoretical uh, change. So uh, the, we, should, we should remember this. Uh, this is important for us to remember that unlike uh, conventional photometry, uh, where, which, uh, which obeys the lambert Beer's law, uh, this reflectance photometry is not linear. As we can see from the uh, equation itself, it has a logarithmic response. Uh, of course, we use a certain transformation to linearize the response, but the basic logarithmic response gives uh, dry chemistry systems two distinct advantages, theoretical advantages. That is, number one is the increase in analytical measurement range, which you will uh, you would be uh, aware in uh, in dry chemistry systems which have a very long AMR, particularly in cases of uh, analytes like AST, ALT. LDH, CPK, and so on. And the second advantage, the second theoretical advantage, which is uh, more pertaining to my discussion, is that this logarithmic response increases the, uh, what I should say, the resolution of the system. By resolution, I mean the uh, power of discrimination between two adjacent signals. This increase in resolution theoretically should give uh, the dry chemistry system an advantage in discriminating the interfering signals. So this is about the theory and why, why, why we feel that dry chemistry system should be better. How it transforms when it comes to practical demonstrations. Uh, let me uh, share with you my personal experiences in this regard. Those who are using wet chemistry systems must be aware of this problem of reporting uh, creatinine results in case of icterus, icteric samples, uh, especially when you are using the alkaline picret method. In these cases in wet chemistry, the uh, values of creatinine go down lower as the values of creatinine in the uh, of values of uh, bilirubin in the sample goes up. We face this problem uh, numerous times and we at times we, we would get results as low as maybe zero or in the uh, negative uh, side for creatinine when the bilirubins uh, would have been above 50 or more. So we thought, ki, uh, chalo dekhte, compare karke. so we uh, compared two, uh, two instruments, one on wet and the other on dry, but uh, the results were disappointing because the dry chemistry systems uh, didn't fare any better. The other analyte, which is uh, problematic in uh, in wet chemistry system is uh, total protein when you use the biuret method. Total protein by biuret method are very sensitive to hemolysis in the presence of hemolysis in the sample. So again, uh, we compared the two, but still the results were not good for the dry chemistry systems. So what can be the explanation? Uh, in my mind, the explanation lies in the uh, molecules of the interference themselves. The molecules such as bilirubin and uh, you know hemoglobin these are smaller molecules and they pass easily through the mic mic uh, microfilters and they ca cause the same havoc and in as in uh, wet chemistry systems in the dry chemistry systems also but the same uh, 
the same explanation would uh, would explain why the dry chemistry systems fare better in case of lipemia as you say, as you know that uh, the triglycerides are bigger molecules they get stuck in the first two layers of the multi multi slide uh, that that we use in the dry chemistry systems and thus they fare better dry chemistry systems fare better when it comes to dealing with lipemia but the uh, major advantage in case of um, in case of dealing with interferences comes in another area and that is the area of that is the area of uh, para protein amias uh, there is an idea amongst us that para proteins are very rarely encountered phenomenon and we we didn't uh, bother with uh, bother, bother about them but uh, it is my humble suggestion that it is not so i can cite uh, you know published literature which says that uh, para proteins occur in almost one third of the samples especially if we use uh, especially if we include the samples of geriatric patients in the age group of 60 or above and these para proteins they play havoc Uh, in a wide range of analytes from uh, bilirubin to electrolytes calcium phosphate magnesium hdl even creatinine there is published literature which says uh, uh, para proteins also uh, cause problems in immunoassays immunoassays with which involves uh, smaller molecules like t3 t4 you get all sorts of bizarre results in wet chemistry system where when para protein is present for example uh, the Direct, uh, direct bilirubin comes out as higher than the total fraction in a perfectly non etheric sample you would find a uh, total bilirubin of say 0.4 and direct, uh, direct bilirubin of uh, 1.2 and then uh, there is a pseudo hyperphosphatemia in the range of say 25 to 27 mg per dl in a uh, perfectly normal sample then you get uh, very low hdl uh, results uh, sometimes even in the single digits in a perfectly normal lipid profile so uh, all these all these bizarre results get corrected almost magically if you use uh, the same sample and rerun the sample in the dry chemistry systems so how does that happen uh, it happens uh, only because that the para proteins these are you know larger molecules and they get stuck in the uh, first two layers uh, fil filtration layers before they can cause any damage in the reaction chain reaction layer so uh, to conclude uh, when it comes to dealing with interferences uh, dry chemistry systems are mainly a mixed bag they offer uh, little or no uh, you know advantages when it comes to hemolysis or icterus it offers advantages when it comes to lipemia but the biggest biggest advantage is in the presence of para proteins of course i would like to add a caveat here Uh, the latest microslides uh, microslides that are available in the market now they incorporate denaturants in the slide itself which denature or degrade the uh, interfering substances like uh, bilirubin or hemoglobin so these should uh, fare better in dealing with interferences but as with everything else uh, even this has got pros and cons it raises the cost of the uh, test itself and i doubt how many labs can uh, you know afford to absorb that extra cost in dealing with interferences so over to you dr sharmista thank you that was very it was very informative thank you dr rajesh to dr rajeshi so so it was on question was on hill but we got an additional bonus in the form of para proteins so now we know that not all are common in fact there are common interference and dry chemistry effectively helps to quell this particular interference of course cost is a factor but we'll come at the end of dr rajesh's answer i think we are fairly there that it is combating the interferences maybe not so much for hemolysis and icterus but definitely for hyperproteinemic and hyperlipidemic samples so coming to the effect of this lipids and proteins uh, definitely they cause interference for virtually all analytes but as many of us know they are the biggest culprits when it comes to estimation of a particular set of analytes that is our electrolytes particularly with regard to 
sodium estimation and to an extent also potassium is affected so my next question to dr rajkumar vidya bhatti devi is when it comes to electrolyte estimations which type of platform is the clear cut choice and why okay. thank you so uh, please uh, show me the uh, slide here again uh, dry chemistry platform can be best option as electrolyte can be done by direct I, uh, ihc method so here this in dry chemistry the ion selective electrode technology is used and here the advantage of this uh, pot uh, potentiometric slide so here in dry chemistry uh, potentiometric slides are used so each pot uh, potentiometric slide is this specific and uh, contains two identical electrodes also this uh, in dry chemistry the, it prevents the pseudo hyponatremia as well as uh, this uh, as well hyponatremia as well as hyperatremia don't need for a separate electrolyte analyzer which reduces the additional capital cost uh, next slide please next slide so why uh, the reason here electrolyte analysis uh, the our previous speaker also has uh, compared to this one uh, two methods the, when we do electrolyte analyzer performed by traditional clinical chemistry commonly in point of care testing so the two different technology measurement of electrolyte measures different quantities brought to report parallel results for normal samples but there is some difference uh, of around 10% have been reported and this uh, in dry chemistry so uh, the, the uh, this electrolyte are done only in the uh, water medium so we can uh, prevent the contamination with this protein and lipid so direct uh, iac reflect the actual clinical relevant activity irrespective of the level of protein and lipid so this is this will be the answer thank you thank you ma'am so much so basically since these electrolytes lie in the water phase when it comes to indirect iac if the water phase no longer remains in the percentage which is normal for it but decreases then automatically what will happen is there will be pseudo or elevated readings but in case of dry chemistry which incorporates direct iac technology what will happen is as ma'am has correctly explained the total amount of the electrolytes which is distributed in the entire sample will be measured and a definite advantage because most of the dry chemistry platforms are coming with the direct iac incorporated onto assays now immuno assays are a part and parcel of every lab's day to day routine so while performing these immuno assays i would like to ask dr ghosh which chemistry system do you feel is better to equip with the two big which is you know as it comes almost every day it happens with most samples uh, on and off one is the proson phenomenon and the other is the dreaded hook effect so dr ghosh if you can please guide us yes yes absolutely it's a very good question and we do see a lot of interference in cases of the immuno assays that we do here in tata we get a lot of tumor markers hormones that we do and uh, we do face uh, interferences due to proson phenomena and hook effect so firstly i just like to briefly highlight on to how a immuno assay uh, is done so the antigen of interest is bound to an antibody and then most of the times it is sandwiched with another detecting antibody so the common interferences or the common uh, problems in these assays are when there is an excess of uh, antigen that is a prozone and it blocks it also may be blocking the other sandwiching antibodies giving rise to a falsely low low value which is known as a hook effect as you see in the b panel so if the detecting antibodies are not able to bind to or sandwich it effectively the final uh, color that is generated or the luminescence that is generated is reduced in nature 
So these are very common interferences that we face in the wet chemistry platforms. Uh, I'll show you how why it is called a hook effect. If you go to the next slide, please. And next, please. Yeah, so wet chemistry along with hook effect and these things as already highlighted by previous uh, panelists, paraproteins are a very big interferent. Also, you have other animal antibodies which interfere like Hamas and there are also carryovers which are problematic in the wet chemistry systems. So next we can see why it is called the hook effect. Next, please. Yeah, next, please. So this is a typical uh, graph in which where you see increasing concentration of the analyte and the signal that is detected by the machine. So if you see all after the peak, even though there is an increase in the analyte or the antigen, there is a drop in the detecting signal. This is typically known as a hook. As you see the peak, it looks like a hook. So that is called the hook effect, which is a very common problem in the wet chemistry uh, or chemiluminescence and any immunoassay that we do. Uh, whereas when we look at these similar assays in the dry chemistry platforms, next please, these interferences are uh, very much reduced in the dry chemistry platforms, mainly because of the different layers that are there. And also these layers sometimes help in a time-graded manner in which the antigens are exposed to the antibodies, which often reduce the hook effect that is seen. So it is a less... Uh, very less interference or as good as no interference that is seen in the uh, immunoassays of the dry chemistry platforms. Uh, next, please. Although this is very good, there are certain possible concerns. If the volumes of the immunoassays are low, it may add to the cost. And also, uh, till recently, we were the dry chemistry platforms have been using streptavidin based uh, uh, slides. So whenever a streptavidin-based slide is used, you have interference from biotin. That often interferes. That is also there even in various wet chemistry platforms. But uh, the dry slide technology majorly has been using the streptavidin. Of course, they are now changing it. And hopefully, once they do it for all the assays, we'll have lesser interference in the future. So overall, in terms of hook effect and prozone phenomena, the dry chemistry technology is much uh, less prone to those interferences as compared to the uh, wet chemistry platforms, in my opinion. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh. Uh, Thank you. Very insightful view. Thank you so much. So basically, when it comes to immunoassays, uh, dry chemistry would definitely be the way to go because they can take care of both the proson phenomenon and the hook effect and getting heterophile antibodies or hammers in patient samples is yes, nothing sir. uncommon. Of course, the cost factor right, is there, but then again, streptavidin, yes, like you, yeah, so, well, when it comes to right, a setup. Because, yeah, 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 absolutely. So we tend to waste more reagent than time when you're doing, when we're doing the dilution and reruns because of identifying the hook effect and proson interferences. The next step will be to do a dilution and repeat. So you're wasting both your reagent as well as time. So those are problems. And of course, if you miss it, then again, you have to uh, co co coordinate with the clinical and correlate the findings with the clinical features. So those are additional problems that are there. Yes. Uh, carry yes, on. So definitely. Sh and when, yeah. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I agree with you 100%. And especially when the kind of setup where you're working in, when it comes to tumor markers and all, we can't afford yeah. to give either a false low or a false high value. I mean, the no, no, ethical and clinical impl implications are quite obvious yes. for all. Absolutely. Very, very true. So, very true. yes. So that is a definite big advantage which dry chemistry offers, leaving aside the biotin interference and the cost issues. Yes. Now, aspect, especially uh, setups uh, dealing with neonatal intensive care or pediatric intensive care is concerned, where neonatal bilirubin estimations are a daily routine almost. My next question would be directed again to Dr. Gulati. As far as this neonatal and delta bilirubin estimations are concerned, which platform, according to you, would be the better choice and why? Ma'am, if you can tell us. Yeah. 
Thank you, Dr. Sharmishta, for a very relevant question. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Uh, Delta bilirubin, as we all know, has been a very elusive analyte to measure. Now, dry chemistry platforms are probably the only commonly available analyzer to give us a value of Delta bilirubin. To understand this, we need to know the various methods of bilirubin estimation and different fractions of bilirubin. HPLC, as we all know, is the gold standard for bilirubin estimation, which measures all the four different fractions of bilirubin, that is unconjugated bilirubin, monoconjugated, diconjugated, and delta bilirubin. Then we have the DISO method, which is the most common method favored by wet chemistry platforms. This method directly measures total bilirubin and direct bilirubin. The direct bilirubin measure, measurement includes delta bilirubin, as well as uh, monoconjugated and diconjugated bilirubin. Indirect or the unconjugated bilirubin is a calculated value. Now, dye chemistry platforms use a totally different method of estimating bilirubin. Here, both unconjugated and conjugated bilirubin react with the mordant, forming a mordant complex, which is measured at different wavelengths, that is 460 nanometer and 400 nanometers respectively. Now, important point to note here is that during estimation of conjugated bilirubin, delta bilirubin is not included in this. The dry chemistry analyzer has a separate slide called total bilirubin, which uses the DISO method, wherein all the four fractions of bilirubin are estimated. And hence, delta bilirubin is obtained by subtracting the sum of BU, which is the unconjugated bilirubin, and DC, which is the conjugated bilirubin, from total bilirubin. Now, coming to the second part of the question regarding neonatal bilirubin. Now, we all know that estimation of neonatal bilirubin is a very important due to physiological hyperbilirubinemia. Now, however, sample collection in neonates is very difficult, leading to frequent hemolysis, and often insufficient sample is obtained. The dry chemistry platform, however, allows estimation of neonatal bilirubin despite these constraints, as only a very small volume of sample is required, that is 10 microliter, and interference of hemoglobin is removed, as has already been discussed by the earlier panelists. Thank you. That actually, uh, I think we are, so many of us may be familiar with the big problem of delta bilirubin. At least in our setup, we often got irate patients who used to come and say that we have recovered from our jaundice, but why is my bilirubin, total bilirubin coming so high after say even one month or one and a half months? It's pretty difficult to explain to lay people the concept of albumin uh, tagged conjugated bilirubin. So that particular fraction, if that can be analyzed separately as a whole, that is a definite advantage. And as far as neonatal bilirubin estimations are concerned, since physiological jaundice is pretty common. And if we have done our internship in the pediatric ward, we all know, all of us know how difficult it is often to get the, bilirub uh, the blood sample from the neonates. The, sub the sample quantity is often deemed insufficient for wet chemistry purposes. So what you have highlighted today, the very minute requirement in dry chemistry platforms for neonatal bilirubin estimation is a definite advantage of this technique. So ma'am, that is a very, very insightful and educating uh, in, uh, instance that you've given. So coming to my next question, if I can have the question, please. My next question is, all the beautiful and very robust aspects of this technique but as we know that there are always two sides to the coin and there are always two aspects to any story so so it must be for dry chemistry also so i would like to direct this question to dr chakravarti are there any potential drawbacks or pitfalls of using these dry chemistry platforms particularly with the system with which you are familiar in your laboratory ma'am if you can just tell us The, this analyzer cannot be used for CSF sample. So we need to have some other option for CSF.
and it is little bit ex expensive. Thank you, ma'am. So definitely it has some disadvantages like uh, it cannot be used for certain fluids and it is a rather expensive technique and there is dry waste generation. But I think overall, if this can be taken into consideration, the technology might be developed further. Definitely they are uh, extremely realistic problems that are there and we need to have a knowledge of these problems if we are to come up with the solutions. So my next question would be directed to Dr. Can I have the next question, please, to Dr. Sarkar? So ma'am has just enumerated the pitfalls. So taking into account all these pros and cons, uh, Dr. Sarkar, in the long run, which chemistry system do you feel would be the more economically viable? Because after all, we have to consider the economic part, the money part of it. So we cannot ignore that. So can you just uh, help? Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Sharmista. I am uh, not an economist, but I would, I would try my best. Uh, uh, well, uh, of course, I would uh, begin by saying that uh, this is a very pertinent question, and we, we all of us, we need to uh, put in a very deep introspection and deliberation in this topic, uh, because. Uh, <clears throat> As we have uh, discussed uh, throughout this uh, webinar, uh, certain advantages have come up. Certain advantages of dry chemistry systems have come up. For example, uh, the, there is, a, you know, number one, there is high throughput and expeditious, expeditious results in dry chemistry systems. There is an uh, element of high automation with minimal requirement of trained staff, etc. Then uh, there is the uh, advantage of portability which can be used as POCT in the POCT services of the labs. And then uh, the issue of a robust mechanics with long calibration stability. And then there, there is also the elimination of potential interference through multi-layered slide technology as we have discussed uh, repeatedly. And then also there is the elimination of uh, advantage of elimination of dead volume requirements and uh, minimal of reagent wastage but uh, regarding all the, but in spite of all these advantages what we can uh, say is we can just uh, reel off names after names of oems which uh, which provide uh, wet chemistry systems from rosh hitachi to, uh, to uh, deckman coulter to then uh, siemens and then uh, abbott so on and so forth but uh, when it comes to dry chemistry systems, uh, there is only a one, we can name only one market leader in this, uh, in this area, that is the uh, OCD or orthoclinical diagnostics. Uh, if we uh, go through the history of the development of dry chemistry technology, uh, we would know that the original uh, platform, which was known as ICTA chem, it came up from the labs of CODA. So and this was in the late 1970s, early 1980s, etc. Then this Ectachem platform was taken up, taken over by uh, Johnson and Johnson, and they renamed it as Vitros. Then that Vitros platform is still now persisting, and the name of the uh, OEM has now changed as OCD. So uh, what we can see is there is one only, only one developed uh, dry chemistry platform uh, from Ectachem to uh, it has got a name change to Vitros, etc. But uh, there are some other bits and pieces players here and there. But uh, by and large, there is a, there is a paucity of uh, participation of uh, OEMs in developing dry chemistry systems. So uh, what might be the causes? Uh, one of the cause is that uh, developing dry chemistry systems require a lot of R&D. Uh, for example, uh, I might say in the development of uh, typically uh, micro slides, 
the requirement of the specific materials needed for the various uh, layers to be formed. It, it's a huge R&D in itself. Then uh, there is the, some typical analytes, for example, <clears throat> say uh, uh, cholesterol. Cholesterol, as we know, is hydrophobic. It does not uh, pass through the uh, filtration layers. So they have to uh, improvise on the slide which uh, tests for cholesterol by impregnating the uh, reagents, for example, cholesterol oxidase and the peroxidase, etc., in the filtration layer itself. So these are uh, technical advantage, uh, advances which need high expertise. So this is one big disadvantage. People uh, or uh, you know manufacturers they hesitate to pour too much money into R and D and develop such platforms. And the other other big disadvantage that we have uh, already discussed is the cost involved. Cost in day-to-day uh, -day running of the biochemistry systems is quite high. Uh, certainly quite high in, uh, when, when we compare with wet chemistry systems. Nowadays, the cost has come down a bit, uh, but still the differential is too huge to, you know, uh, make amends. So uh, in this, in this uh, scenario, are there some, uh, can there be some solutions? So uh, there, there, in my mind, there are some solutions. Uh, for example, I can uh, give you the example of a uh, IIT Kharagpur researcher. This is news, uh, pretty recent news. Uh, well, uh, uh, not so recent. It's uh, uh, one BC news that is one year before Corona. It's in 2019. Uh, they say that the researcher, uh, Professor Suman Chakravarti, he has uh, developed a, a system which uses pretty, you know, uh, easily available blotting paper and uh, he uses only a drop of blood and uh, reflectance photometry to measure the analytes. And uh, after computation of the costs involved, if we leave aside the uh, reagent costs, it comes to only uh, one rupee per test, which is too less. I, I believe uh, startups and entrepreneurs, uh, you know, innovative entrepreneurs like this should be, uh, uh, should come up in, uh, on the platform and uh, you know, collaborate uh, collaborate with the OEMs, which uh, which dish out this uh, dry chemistry system, so that it can be a win-win situation for us all. And uh, it would be a very uh, grave disservice for us all, and a very big disappointment for us all, if uh, dry chemistry system is uh, left high and dry. We should uh, we should uh, make you know innovative suggestions and uh, th things like that. Uh, which can be employed gainfully for us all. Uh, well, I believe this is the, this is all. Thank you, Dr. Shomishka. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rajeshi. So basically, it is an expensive uh, technology. Yes, comes with the costs, and unless we can really afford to, it's very easy to say that we want this and we want that, but always the cost factor is there but then again it is also probably very cost effective once it is installed the hidden costs are often maybe taken care of however what has uh, what uh, dr rajeshi just showed the clipping of august 2018 if such a low cost device can be developed such entrepreneurs i should always be encouraged because that will actually like dr rajeshi said help us to take it to a win-win situation so I would like to offer my concluding question. Can I have it, please? So to conclude, I would like to rest the honors with Dr. Uh, Rekha Kumari. Ma'am, we have had such an exhaustive discussion on dry chemistry today. We have seen so many pros, so many uh, advantages. We have seen the potential pitfalls, the cost factor. But at the end of it all, in a nutshell, if you can just pinpoint a single best use or a single best rationally for using a dry chemistry system, I think our audience would be greatly benefited. So, ma'am, if you can tell us. Yes, thank you, Dr. Sarmisha. Uh, you have asked me a difficult question because all of our speakers have uh, told about the advantages of dry chemistry and uh, disadvantages also. 
and out of that we have to see what is the single best thing so that we can opt for dry chemistry uh in my opinion the advantages of dry chemistry which is important is its quick and accurate result and second thing is it needs very less volume of sample so exploiting these three qualities of dry chemistry it can be used as a point of care testing system the purpose behind the poct is its rapid result so that patient management can be done accordingly in due time suppose you have a patient from a remote area having a chest pain and up to reach to the hospital it takes about 2 to 3 hours and when the patient reaches to you you want to differentiate the diagnosis and you take the sample and send to the wet lab then it will be late and you can lose your patient in that case if poct is used to differentiate the cases it may be a boon to save the patient or at least to delay the complications so poct can be used in emergency ward example is suppose a unconscious patient has come having a history of diabetes you have to differentiate whether it is a case of hypoglycemia or whether it is a case of uh, hyperosmolar coma in that case if you have a glucometer if you have a urine strip which is based on dry chemistry you can differentiate and start your test you start your treatment it can be used in icu it can be used in a neonatal unit uh, which dr gulati has already uh, explained that it needs a very small volume so that will be an advantage because taking a blood sample from a neonatal is a great pain or thing it can be used in cardiac unit so in my opinion use of dry chemistry if you tell about a single best result that is poct use of dry chemistry as poct thank you very nicely elucidated ma'am and i think this is a very practical aspect not only in the emergency setup where time constraint is a definite factor to consider and we need very quick and very reliable results in the nicu in the pediatric intensive care unit also as well as in small clinics in these places time as well as the accuracy of results they take the predominance secondly what you have highlighted is a very important point regarding the self monitoring like the smbg or the self monitoring of the blood glucose and patients nowadays uh, lay people they are very privy to these kind of techniques which are mostly based on dry chemistry only yeah so this is a very good point you have highlighted thank you so much so we come to the end of our webinar and i hope our audience had as good an exposure as even i had and it was a very well conducted uh, session by our panelists so i give the charge to dr sen now to take any questions that may have arisen thank you thank you so much <clears throat> thank you it's a uh, uh... my heart felt gratitude to all uh, speakers and moderator who has actually all of them has done wonderful job and it's a very ultimately been a very interesting and a very perfectly coordinated webinar so we have got certain uh, questions some are related to the technique somebody is also saying that shall i get a copy of the presentation so yes our answer is surely you can uh we are having a recording we will be uh showing this recording or we will be delivering the link in our uh, whatsapp group of sclmp con and uh, you can definitely uh take the download the link and go for the presentation the whoever has missed it and also uh there was one question uh that can you explain regarding qc and calibration in dry chemistry so whoever has taken the topic of calibration of dry chemistry i think dr vidyavati devi so can you please uh, uh, explain this question can you uh, 
uh, address this question here because one co this question has been raised here in this platform. So, uh, uh, thank you, sir. Actually, uh, uh, this uh, calibration is uh, quite important uh, point. So, to answer this question in, in case of uh, dry chemistry, calibration is required only uh, once in six uh, months only. And uh, about the quality uh, control, uh, practically no external variables are there in dry chemistry. Since the reagents are in ready to use slide form, there are no external activities or variables that could affect the quality of the results. So daily standardization of reason is eliminated in dry chemistry. So repeated, repeatability is excellent and well proven. So accuracy is very good. Most customers use dry chemistry as the benchmark for cross-checking wet chemistry results that are suspect. So physical and chemical interferences are eliminated by spreading layer in the slide as all many panelists has also described well. So I, this is the answer for calibration and quality control in this. Uh, Thank you. Dry chemistry. So there are a few questions uh, which actually been raised, which I cannot answer in this uh, platform. So it is said that the, can you tell about leading companies in dry chemistry? Yes, we can obviously, but since this pro platform is not to pro promote any company. So unfortunately for the uh, ethical area, I cannot actually give that answer because there are, are two only companies there who actually um, practice on dry chemistry and one is a very market leading giant. So I think you can get the answer anywhere. So on this platform, we will not name any of the companies. So I'm uh, not addressing this concern, this particular question. Second, this one is a dry chemistry can be used as a bedside or emergency test which can be confirmed by waste chemistry method. How true is the statement? So uh, <coughs> I think Dr. Rekha Kumari can give this uh, answer on that. Can I, can I repeat this? Uh, should I repeat this question once more, ma'am? Yeah, it is. They are saying that dry chemistry can be used as a bedside or emergency test, which can be confirmed by wet chemistry method. How true is this statement? Sir, it is not always the case that every test you have to conform with the bed chemistry. Because if you are doing in your setup, so with calibration and control, you can understand or you can know the value what it is coming. It happens usually, suppose a cardiac patient has come to your cardiac ward, cardiac emergency, there you do the troponin I immediately in zero hours. But to see how much extent it is, you are doing a hypersensitivity troponin or uh, you are doing angiography to see the extent. So it is not necessary always the same test has to be repeated and confirmed. Although I'm not a speaker over here, but still I would like to have a view on that. The dry chemistry system is a separate chemistry system which is as equivalent to that as of weight chemistry system. This is not a point of care technology like a glucometer or something like a ABG. So therefore, uh, I don't think there is any justification of thinking here that a dry chemistry test can be confirmed by weight chemistry. Those are validated tests. Those have got equal proportion, equal chances of getting calibration as well as control checking. So these are two different chemistry yes, systems. Sir. Yes, but sir. it is not that this is only a point of care testing. So uh, then another question, uh, Dr. Swanima Singh has uh, raised that question that why CSF cannot be measured? Vitros 350 offers CSF protein glucose estimation. So uh, who would like to uh, take up the call? Dr. Ruplekha, can you please answer this? Uh, actually, uh, my question was that uh, that uh, pitfalls that I am getting with my uh, my system that is I am using in my lab, and uh, in that analysis, it is a, as it is a closed system, 
so and the uh, uh, slides are not available from that company that's why we cannot do in our lab csf as a, use as csf as a sample there but in other dry chemistry platform it <laughs> must be uh, that the reagent must be uh, present yeah so yes uh, ma'am that question has been raised is very uh, optimum thank you for the question yes vitros 350 offers csf protein and glucose estimation so it may be some other system does not have it uh, but uh, it can be done in dry chemistry and the last one is why bicarbonate measured as co2 in dry chemistry system so uh, who is going to answer that why bicarbonate is measured as co2 it's not co2 it measured an eco2 actually in dry chemistry system so i think uh, dr kinjal ka can you answer this yes absolutely so in uh, dry chemistry the why carbonate is measured as co2 because the co2 gas is uh, released as the as the product and it, there is a membrane which through which it diffuses and that is detected and not just in dry chemistry even in wet chemistry platform that we are using here the beckman uh, au 5800 over here also they the assay is basically measuring co2 and not bicarbonate directly so i think it is the way the assay is structured that is why it is measuring co2 instead of bicarbonate but there is not much difference because when you compare it in the serum it is basically it balances out there is the equilibrium which is reached that is if that makes sense thank you thank you and uh, i think the question answers is yep. that much and that is uh, so far the questions i have already discussed whatever has been raised and it's uh, a wonderful session as uh, we have ultimately come up with so the entire sclmp team has worked a lot on it because this is the first time we are doing it on our own platform so uh, the entire team with our backup supports of our uh, it what i should say our it cell and all everybody so now i'd like to call our uh, assistant general secretary dr minal pal to uh, conclude the session with a vote of thanks dr minal can you please be available so oh, thank you dr sir so good evening everybody uh, we are at the end of this wonderful well conducted seminar uh, webinar sorry on dry chemistry system and the, from the desk of ags i like to congratulate all the speakers and the moderator thank you dr rajeshri sarkar dr kinjal ka ghosh dr chakraborty dr ruplekha chakraborty i think dr dipika gulati dr rajkumari vidyavati devi dr rekha kumari and dr swarmista choudhury thank you for your wonderful and lucid elaborative speech and i like to thank all the participants present here actually they have made this program successful one and this is our first independent webinar venture we have using our own platform for the first time so i like to congratulate all the organizers thank you very much and hope for a next uh, very good uh, webinar in this platform again thank you very much and good night so thank you all for uh, being with us and uh, last but not the least the entire director of the show dr moshumin saikia 
give a big hand for her she has actually so handedly conducted the entire thing running from behind and actually uh, being the mastermind of this program and also along with well uh, supported by dr teresa bishwas so i thought that i should uh, give that uh, vote of thanks vote of thanks is already done so officially that concluded but i think i should mention one more name is mr anil prasad our it support team who has done excellent job to actually make it possible What thank you all uh, congratulations and very well done team ccl mp proud of our team thank you thank you sir thank you thank so you, much thank you sir thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. you have brought all of us from different parts of india okay. to a platform so thank nice. you so much thank you so much uh...